We'll start the next portion of the course looking at macroevolution, that is, the evolutionary processes that create new species from their ancestors, and more specifically, how we recognize which species are related to which. This lecture will also look briefly at humans' mammal relatives, and chapter six and seven then will be devoted to primates. So to begin with, if we're studying macroevolution, and macroevolution is the creation of a new species, it should be obvious that we really need to understand the species concept and how species can be identified and described. The first thing we need to cover then is biological classification. Classification, of course, is just the process of putting things into classes. Taxonomy is the branch of science concerned with the rules of classifying organisms on the basis of evolutionary relationships. To put it another way, taxonomy is the study of how to do classification of living things in the best, most useful way. We can't tell if new species have appeared unless we can list out the species both before and after and see that those lists are different. To do that, we need to be able to classify individual animals into species. Traditionally, those categories have been based on the physical similarities between different animals. Linnaeus was the first person to really systematize the process, and he introduced the idea that categories should be hierarchically nested. Small categories contain a few species that are very similar to one another, and those are then lumped into larger categories that contain more species but with more differences from one another. Linnaeus based the larger and smaller categories of his system on homologies, similarities between organisms based on descent from a common ancestor. This image is a classic way of describing homology. It shows the skeletal structure of several vertebrates forelimbs. You'll notice that despite the differences in shape and size, the numbers of bones and how they articulate with one another are very similar. This is because all of the species inherited that structure from their common ancestor, the so-called stem reptile. We specify that homologies exist because of common descent to distinguish them from another kind of similarity, analogies, or similarities between organisms based strictly on common function with no assumed common evolutionary descent. Natural selection adapts species to their natural environments so sometimes species in similar environments evolve similar traits, even though their common ancestor lacked those traits. This process is called homoplasy or convergent evolution. Homoplasy is the process that creates analogy, the result. The difference between homologies and analogies was one that Linnaeus did not understand because he didn't understand evolution. So some of the categories he constructed based on certain analogical traits turned out not to make any sense. For example, he originally classified whales as fish because of the analogy that they lived in the ocean. Very quickly, however, he realized the problem with that since whales have more similarities with mammals than with fish. So in the second edition of his book, whales were classed as mammals where they remain today. This highlights another basic requirement of modern biological taxonomy. It must construct categories of species that reflect evolutionary relationships. Larger categories include all species descended from more distant ancestors, while smaller categories include only those species descended from more recent common ancestors. So let's assume these four dots represent four living species. These species group together into two genera. That taxonomic grouping conveys exactly the same information as saying that species A and B are both descended from species E, while C and D are descended from a different ancestor, species F. Meanwhile, both genera, one and two, belong to a family. That says that both species E and F are descended from a more distant ancestor, G. Therefore, with a properly constructed biological taxonomy, you can easily tell how recently two species shared a common ancestor by finding the smallest category to which they both belong. The smaller the category, the more recent the common ancestry. But how do you begin constructing those categories in the first place? How did I know to put A and B in genus one 
but to put C in a different genus. It can't be because I already knew their ancestry because the main reason to study taxonomy is to learn the ancestry. Today, most evolutionary scientists classify species using the strategy of cladistics, an approach to classification that attempts to make rigorous evolutionary interpretations based solely on analysis of certain types of homologous characters or traits. In cladistics, most homologies are considered unhelpful and analysis must focus only on certain kinds of homologies. A clade is a group of organisms sharing a common ancestor. The group consists of the common ancestor and descendants. Each species defines its own clade, consisting of itself and any species that might descend from it. On this diagram, there are seven clades, one each for each of the four living species, each genus and its ancestor, and the whole family and all ancestor species. Because of this emphasis on ancestors, cladistics is very concerned with differentiating ancestral from derived traits. An ancestral trait is one that was present in the common ancestor of the clade. It is thus a homology between the ancestor and the descendant, as well as between any two descendant species that preserve the ancestral trait. Species that share ancestral traits are members of the same clade since they both inherit the trait from their common ancestor. But other descendants of the same ancestor may have lost that specific trait, such as snakes losing the legs of their reptile ancestors. Snakes are still reptiles, but we can't identify them as such just by looking for the ancestral trait of four legs. What we need to identify is not the ancestral trait, but the derived or modified trait which is characteristics that have arisen by changing the ancestral form. Derived traits indicate that the ancestral trait was once present. Snakes have no legs, but they do have vestigial pelvises that indicate legs were once present in their ancestors. Species with shared derived traits belong to the same clade because their traits all developed from the same ancestral form. The more derived traits two species share, the more recently they shared a common ancestor. For example, having multiple different kinds of teeth, a trait called heterodont dentition, is an ancestral trait of mammals. Saying that humans have four kinds of teeth, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, doesn't tell us much of anything about our evolutionary relationship with either dogs or baboons. Since they both also have heterodont dentition, we can say that we're related at some level, but not really which. We can't tell whether we're more closely related to baboons or to dogs. But let's look for a shared derived trait. How many of each kind of tooth? We see that we have two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars in each half of each jaw. This is the dental formula for the human species. Humans and baboons both have this same formula, two, one, two, three. In the upper jaws of dogs, dogs have three, one, four, two. So humans and baboons share the derived trait as well as the ancestral trait. Dogs share the ancestral trait, but not the derived trait. So we're more closely related to baboons than we are to dogs. In this case, heterodont dentition is the ancestral trait and it wasn't particularly helpful. The dental formula is the derived trait and it was helpful. Cladistics focuses exclusively on derived traits to determine evolutionary relatedness. Of course, the end result of cladistic analysis is a taxonomy, a series of hierarchically arranged categories that consistently reflect evolutionary relationships. Strictly speaking, the statistical processes used to create those categories produce a cladogram, a chart showing evolutionary relationships based solely on interpretation of shared derived traits. It contains no time component and does not imply ancestor-descendant relationships. On a cladogram, 
at least the style of cladogram. Each horizontal line represents a clade. The vertical lines that branch off of the same horizontal line all represent groups that belong to that clade. The lower the horizontal line is on the chart, the more vertical lines branch off of it, so the bigger the clade. Strictly speaking, cladograms do not indicate which species are ancestral to which others. They just show how closely related species are to one another. For example, this cladogram of the land-dwelling vertebrates shows a close relationship between birds and theropod dinosaurs, the two-footed ones like T. rex. Strictly speaking, cladograms do not indicate which species are ancestral to which others. They just show how closely related species are to one another. For example, this cladogram of the land-dwelling vertebrates shows a close relationship between birds and theropod dinosaurs, the two-footed ones like T. rex. They belong to the same small clade in the upper right. The reason these two groups are so closely related is that the theropods are the ancestors of the birds, like grandparents and grandchildren. Meanwhile, the theropod bird clade and the other dinosaurs both belong to the same larger clade one step farther down the cladogram. But in this case, the theropod bird group is more like a cousin to the other dinosaur group. The cladogram itself doesn't give us the information necessary to differentiate between the ancestor-descendant relationship and the cousin relationship. All cladistics does is show relatedness. As statistically accurate as that is, it isn't really what our brains want to see when we talk about evolution over time. We want to see a phylogenetic tree, a chart showing evolutionary relationships that contains a time component and implies ancestor-descendant relationships. This phylogenetic tree shows the same groups of living things as the cladogram, but now you can see clearly that the bird branch splits off of the dinosaur branch, indicating that some dinosaurs are ancestors of birds. But the dinosaur branch continues past that branching point, so some dinosaurs are not ancestral to birds. The phylogenetic tree thus contains information not present in the cladogram. And that information comes from the scientist's interpretation of the data. The cladogram is a mathematical and exact representation of observation data. The phylogenetic tree is a theory put forward by the scientist and attempt to explain the cladogram's data. Different scientists can look at the same cladogram and construct different phylogenetic trees. Then the next step is to seek more data to test those theories. Okay, so if we want to start studying macroevolution, we need to gather together all the species that we know about and then use a cladistic analysis to determine how closely related they are. Then we can make some interpretations about ancestor descendant relationships and tell which species developed into which others. As I said at the beginning of this lecture, this assumes we have a strong grasp of the species concept. The most popular definition of species today, the one we discussed a few lectures back, is called the biological species concept. It states that a species is a group of individuals capable of fertile interbreeding with one another, but reproductively isolated from other such groups. Speciation, the most basic process of macroevolution, is the process by which a new species evolves from an earlier species. Because speciation usually takes place over millions of years, studying it usually involves studying fossils. Fossils tell us what the ancestral species looked like, but there's a problem. We define species according to their reproductive behavior, something we can observe directly for living species. But fossils are just rocks. Rocks don't reproduce. So how can we define a species in the fossil record? We know that when those animals were alive, they must have reproduced. And uniformitarianism tells us that the idea of reproductive isolation was just as applicable in the past as it is today. But if we can't observe reproductive behavior, how can we tell which fossil animals interbred with which others? Well, put simply and much more directly than your textbook, we can't.
fossil species are not biological species at all, really. They're paleo species, species defined from fossil evidence and inferred to be reproductively isolated. That is, we've looked at the skeletal evidence and we've decided that these animals were similar enough to one another, that is, intraspecific variation is low, and they're different enough from other animals, interspecific variation is high, and that they probably constituted a species. We make that decision based on how much variation can be seen in modern similar species, species which are usually considered to be their descendants. Paleo species are theoretical constructs. We can't observe them directly, only through the lens of their fossils and their evolutionary descendants. Paleo species also present an entirely different problem from living biological species. Because they're theoretical constructs, and because the fossil record is usually so spotty, they often cover very long time spans. Because microevolution is constant, and because it's the basis of macroevolution, species that cover extremely long time spans, like paleo species, may have considerable variation from the oldest to the youngest. For example, the longest lived human ancestor was Homo erectus, who, by some accounts, was present on the earth for about 1.5 million years. Could an early Homo erectus around 1.8 million years ago interbreed with one of the latest Homo erectus around 400,000 years ago? They were biologically similar, but certainly they were much more different from one another than any two living human beings are today. So based on that observation, we might conclude that those two specimens were unable to interbreed and therefore they should be called by different species names. One is Homo erectus and the other is Homo whatever. But Homo whatever is a descendant of Homo erectus. Where do we draw the line to split the Homo erectus species off from its descendant? If we're going to divide one unbroken lineage into two paleo species, we'll have to draw the line somewhere and divide a parent of one species from its child in another species. And that violates what we know of microevolution, that parents and children always belong to the same species. Paleo species, therefore, are really not the same thing as biological species. Biological species are observations, they're data. And paleo species are interpretations. They're theoretical constructs, only valid if the theory is valid. Which paleo species are proper depend on which theory is being tested. Different scholars with different research questions will assign different paleo species names to the same fossils. The particular labels are only useful as long as they're useful. If you get too caught up in deciding which species label to slap on a particular fossil, you'll likely miss other more important issues. Keep that in mind as we wade through dozens of hominin species names over the next couple weeks. Okay, let's look at a couple patterns we see when we study macroevolution. One of the most recognizable is called an adaptive radiation. The relatively rapid expansion and diversification of life forms when they move into new ecological niches. This is when one ancestral species suddenly evolves into many descendants, all with different traits. When you create a phylogenetic tree of this process, you see one trunk split into many branches, with the branches radiating in all directions. It's a common pattern in the history of life on Earth. Mammals underwent an adaptive radiation after the extinction of most dinosaur species 65 million years ago, and hominins went through an adaptive radiation about 3 million years ago, which is why there will be so many species names to learn over the next few chapters. But it's important to understand that radiations occur throughout the living world. Understanding adaptive radiation requires understanding generalized and specialized traits. Some animals are generalized. They're adapted to be able to perform a wide variety of tasks and to change their behavior in response to the environment, but they may not be particularly efficient at what they do. Specialized species follow the opposite strategy. They're adapted to do only a few things, but they do them very, very well. 
Usually, only generalized species are able to take full advantage of new niches because they are able to change to fit the new environment. Thus, the ancestral species of an adaptive radiation is almost always more generalized and its descendants are more specialized. Also, there's the question of the rate at which macroevolutionary changes occur. Darwin saw evolutionary change as slow, steady, and incremental. The rate of change did not change. This view is called gradualism and was the common view of most scientists throughout much of the 20th century. It views macroevolution similarly to the tortoise in the tortoise and the hare. Once the race starts, the tortoise moves along slow and steady from the start line to the finish line. But since the 1970s, many scholars have come to the conclusion that the pace of evolutionary change is not steady. The rate of change, in fact, changes. There are long periods of stability, or equilibrium, broken up, or punctuated, by relatively short periods of rapid evolutionary change. This view is called punctuated equilibrium. This views macroevolution like the hare. Once the race starts, he shoots off very quickly, then stops and takes a rest, then shoots off very fast again, then pauses until he reaches the finish line. The different interpretations have some significant effects on how scholars connect species through time. If fossil two is the descendant of fossil one, a gradualist would describe the evolutionary path between them with a straight line. Punctuated equilibrium would describe the path with some kind of curve. More vertical parts represent punctuations, more horizontal parts show equilibria. Each curve is a theory. The only way to distinguish between these different theories is to find more fossils that fall between one and two and see where along which curve they fall. The final thing I'd like to look at is a quick overview of the mammals to set us up for the next section of the course where we'll be studying primates. Mammals have evolved over many millions of years and they've really flourished and diversified in the last 65 million years. Studying these extremely long periods of time is very hard for human beings. We really lack the mental capacity to understand the time scale on which macroevolution operates. But geologists uh, who deal with time scales even longer than evolutionary biologists have systematized their understanding of history into the geological time scale. The division of Earth's history into eras, hundreds of millions of years, periods, scores of millions of years, and epochs, millions to tens of millions of years. It's this system that evolutionists use to describe large scale macroevolution. Most important for this class will be the last four epochs, the Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Holocene. It's the, since the last bit of the Miocene that hominins have evolved and diverged from other primates. For this unit, I'd like you to know those four epochs in that order. Next unit will add numbers to describe how many years in the past each of these epochs occurred. What sets mammals off from other vertebrates? In general, mammals are selected for larger brains when compared to body size, a statistic called encephalization. Mammals have greater encephalization compared to birds, reptiles, etc. This means that mammals have a greater capacity to learn and solve problems. They can adapt their behavior to a changing environment much more easily than other species. Humans, of course, take this to the extreme, where most of our adaptive strategies are behavioral, that is, culture. Most mammals are also selected for in utero development of young, that is, offspring emerge from their mother already somewhat developed. In other species, the zygote is laid in an egg and develops outside the mother's body. In utero development allows for more protection and support of the embryo as it develops. The mother's own body can transfer nutrients to the embryo throughout the most crucial phases of development. So while encephalization allows adult individuals to solve problems and survive longer, this trait promotes successful reproduction. Both traits would obviously be advantageous in natural selection. Mammals also have heterodont dentition, which we've already touched on,
This allows most mammals to eat a wide variety of foods, another advantageous trait for the ancestral mammal trying to expand into dinosaurs' niches. The last characteristic mammalian trait your textbook mentions is shared with birds and probably some dinosaurs, endothermy or warm-bloodedness. The ability to maintain internal body temperature by producing energy through metabolic processes within cells. This allows mammals to exist in a variety of environments. In cold environments, the body stays warm, and in warm environments, the body cools itself. The one major absolutely essential characteristic of all mammals, which your textbook skips over for some reason, is the ability to produce milk. The words mammal and mammary share the same root. All mammal mothers produce milk to feed their offspring for a period of time after birth. This is an extension of the in utero developmental phase, when mother's nutrients are passed to the young to ensure they survive childhood and reproduce. These are all shared traits of mammals. Almost all mammals have them in one manner or another, which suggests that they might be ancestral traits of the clade. Now, let's look at some derived traits that divide the clade into smaller groups specifically the three major divisions of mammals according to how they reproduce. The smallest division of mammals is the monotremes, egg-laying mammals. Today, there are only a few species of monotreme, the platypus and several species of echidna. These mammals do lay eggs, but unlike birds and reptiles, the eggs are retained in the mother for some time and they're only laid late in the gestation period. So there is a period of in utero development. Because egg laying is an ancestral trait of vertebrates, we think monotremes are the oldest form of mammal and other mammals share the derived trait of giving live birth. The second division of mammals is the marsupials. These are animals who give live birth to only somewhat developed young. That little thing in the lower left is a newborn kangaroo. The young then instinctively crawl into a pouch on the mother where, still technically outside the mother's body, they will continue to develop for some time. There is still an in utero period, but it's very short compared to the in pouch period. Finally, there are the placental mammals who have the longest in utero period and give birth to even more developed young. This is possible because placental mammals have developed a placenta a specialized organ that connects the fetus to the mother's circulatory system much more effectively than earlier strategies. Because this allows for much longer gestation and much more protected development of young, the placental mammals are by far the most numerous today. We, of course, are placental mammals. You can easily see how these different reproductive strategies evolved over time with mammals. First came monotremes, which preserved the ancestral trait of laying eggs, but which are almost extinct today. From them evolved marsupials, which give live birth, but do so in a very rudimentary way. And from them evolved the placental mammals, which share the derived trait of a placenta. Starting with the next lecture, we'll examine in detail one particular kind of placental mammal, the primates.